Welcome to the Irish NFL Show's live coverage of the 2024 Free Agency Frenzy uh, in association with our partner, Quinn Bet. It's actually an even month today since our last live broadcast, uh, February 11th, which obviously was Super Bowl Sunday from inside the cosy confines of Legion Stadium before we stepped out into the chill Las Vegas air to bring the sun down on the season. Time to focus now on 2024, though, and hope always springs at this time of the year because between today and March 13th, all 32 NFL teams can tamper to their heart's content, negotiate with free agents and try to tie down that deal that they hope will put them over the top. And whether they stay or whether they go, we'll bring you all the key signings and assess who got paid, who got fleeced and which players and teams are set up best to succeed in the 2024-2025 NFL season. Uh, before we get stuck into all that, though, just wanted to let you know that our live show, Buskers on the Ball in Temple Bar, now sold out. Uh, Peter King of NBC Sports fame, PFT Live, will be with us on the 28th of March, Holy Thursday for that show in association with our partners, Quinbet, Point, and the Erlingus College Football Classic. Obviously, want to say from the Irish NFL show, thank you to everyone uh, who bought tickets. Uh, we're really counting the days until uh, we get to sit down with Peter King and, you know, perhaps as importantly, uh, get to reconnect with the Irish NFL community in real life. Uh, welcome back, Brian. And obviously, we've been active in free agency as well because we applied the, the non-exclusive franchise tag. Is that how we frame it, Noel, to, to Noel Dowling? A new, new face and new voice to the show. Someone who's... who's uh, dabbled in the Irish NFL show but we'll be hearing and seeing a lot more of in the season ahead and we couldn't be more excited about that welcome Noel it's always good to have another Bears fan on the show we went from zero to two in the space of two seasons we're uh we're, we're, we're bearing down in a big way that's it no no I appreciate being uh being able to come on with you guys and uh, as you say yeah we can we've got Brian there in the middle now two Bears on either side so you know we'll see how that goes Right, we'll start with some of the, the stories on this, the first day of the free agency window and a couple of teams already emerging for people who maybe haven't as nerdily been following it today as we have. A uh, big couple of big quarterback moves already. Uh, Russell Wilson at the Steelers, people might have seen over the weekend. Kirk Cousins, the big uh, marquee signing today, though, moving from the Vikings to the Falcons. Um, big moves involving running back seem to be a real feature this year as well. The running back market actually a little bit frothy and some interesting deals for interesting money. We get into all of that. Green Bay Packers, very active, probably one of the most active teams so far, both in terms of who they've signed and who's gone the other way, particularly big moves uh, on the running back side for them. Uh, and the Dolphins taking a bit of pain to get in under the cap. They've let a couple of, uh, of big players go who found new teams, and that could uh, change the complexion of not only the Dolphins, but the, the teams who welcome uh, the signings that have gone the other way, the free agent moves there. But, Brian, let's start with that, with that Kirk Cousins signing. It's a four-year deal to the Falcons. $180 million is the total value of that. $100 million guaranteed money. Few people have negotiated free agency as well as Kirk Cousins. He seems to find the perfect time to move uh, and yet again, he's pulled it off. I think an agent deserves a, a statue in some state across the US by the time this is all over. It's, I suppose, over the course of the last four days, it's come more kind of a reality. This is the likelihood he was going to move on and go to Atlanta. Seems to be the, the obvious team. And I'm judging by some of the information read today, his family background in terms of his wife seems to be from that local area as well. So once we spoke with Justin Fields for a week in and week out, you know, myself and I have been doing various podcasts, and that seemed like a likely move. This one over the course of the last 40 years really started to kind of gather momentum and gather pace. There was a lot of talk today. The Vikings were doing everything, pushing the boat to try secure a deal. But let's not forget, this was Kirk Cousins is a fantastic quarterback in his own right and has had some really successful seasons. He's coming off a season ending injury where he hadn't played beyond week six, six, week seven. He's on the wrong side of 30. Yes, he's got all the attributes to go in there. You spoke about time and time again, Connor, last year around this Falcons team, heavily stocked in offensive, only they had a better quarterback. It makes a lot of sense, but sometimes this time of year we look at a deal and go, oh, that makes a lot of mistakes. And Sorry, a lot of sense, and then it's a lot of mistakes that come with the deal in terms of what they've given up as well. So for the Falcons, they need to, they need to resolve this. Was, this has gone on too long in terms of trying to have a quarterback for the future. It's a lot of money, Nolan, and a lot of guaranteed money, as Brian says, for a guy who's coming off a serious injury. It's an Achilles injury that he did, and you know, and a very unfortunate one for him. It's tough for any player to go down with an injury of that sort, but he was playing lights out, in fairness to him. He was having one of his best seasons. Uh, he was on track for well over 4,000 yards, was really playing well, um, and, and then suddenly the, the season got derailed, and now we won't see him back in Minnesota again. Yeah, no, as you say, it's 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 some money that he, he's gone there for, but there will be question marks with an older player who is coming back from such an injury like that. 
but it, it's interesting. It shows where the Falcons obviously believe that their roster is, that they were maybe just a quarterback away from kind of guiding these young, exciting players into the potential that they, they've kind of shown. Um, obviously, Raheem Morris talked about last year that he wouldn't be there if the quarterbacks had the, were any good at all last season. So they've gone out and they've made that big move now. And it, as I say, we talked to Justin Fields potentially going there, and that would have been kind of a, a future move where he could kind of develop there. But this is the opposite. This is, you know, we think we can do something. And we're going to go and we're going to spend on an experienced quarterback to come in here who we think can actually push us over the edge. So it, it is. It's going to be interesting to see how, one, he develops from that injury, and then, two, can he actually fulfill what you know you you would imagine they can see in him paying that kind of money to bring him in? The, the Justin Fields side note is kind of kind of interesting though, and obviously not just for Bears fans because the the two teams who seem the most likely, and um, if the Bears are are going to move on from Fields, which seems very likely, but the two teams who seemed like they were heading up to Justin Fields sweepstakes were the Falcons and the Steelers. They've both gone elsewhere. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, I posed that question earlier on today is, you know, what happens to Justin Fields now? It's it's really, you know, as great a situation as it is for Ryan Poles and the Bears, you now look at the Justin Fields kind of scenario and you think, what happens here? Do they just dump him for, for whatever they can get? Do they bring him into the locker room, which could be an interesting dynamic if they do go number one with Caleb Williams? Um so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there was kind of outside talk of the Raiders, but I believe that's not going to happen now either. So I, I don't know. I don't see a landing spot for Fields at the moment. So may, maybe someone can surprise us, get a deal done. But, I mean, it's, it, it is going to be fascinating now to watch to see how that actually does develop. Or maybe the Fields fans will get their way. Maybe the Bears want to keep him. You know? yeah, I, I wonder now that they end up rolling into the season with him still on the roster because uh, quarterbacks will go down and suddenly what looks like a third or fourth round pick for Fields becomes a second round pick very quickly when, when teams become quarterback needy again. So we shall see. Uh, Brian said he was going to be a giant for life, but Saquon is gone. Uh, yeah, you have to come to me on that one. I tell you what, I held that one back for quite some time. It, it stings. It really does sting. People have um, been waiting for a live show for a month. You want to hit them with the zingers yeah. up front? When I read in one of his tweets he put out two years ago, it's a bit of an Alex Smith scenario. You know, back in the day when he, he he declared his hate for Manchester United, but the minute they came calling, he left Leeds United as quickly as he could get out the door. Uh, Saquon Barkley has some very stepping out bits of media pieces over the course of the years where he declares his hate for the Eagles, but tongue in cheek, maybe. I mean, you can argue the deal is comprehensive in the sense of it's one of the most aggressive moves today in terms of a free agency deal for a running back 27 million over three years. Personally, I don't think the Giants played it very well in the end. They, I get the deal. I get why the Giants have done this. You know, you can't be tied into running back. If Colin was here now, he'd argue that it's ultimately it's down to the Daniel Jones contract and we're still, you know, feeling the pain in that contract last year, which has led to this and that led to tags. But I think most Giants fans recognize he's going. I just think it's where he's gone, unfortunately. There's not many rivalries in the NFL that stack up in terms of pure hatred, and this is one of them. And as Packers and, and Bears fans will, would know, they don't like the same players swapping one for another. But look, the Giants have other teams. They've, they've brought in Devin Singletary to, you know, in the last two hours. It's not going to suffice in terms of satisfying the Giants' needs for a running back, so it'll be interesting to see where else they go in this. But for Barkley, I suppose he's looked at it. The three leading teams today, if you read it, read it and read and believe the report, were the Texans, the Bears, and the Eagles. And ultimately, he's chosen the Eagles because he probably feels that's his best opportunity. And from a logistics perspective, he probably doesn't even have to move house, whatever that comes with that. Yeah. And a good opportunity within the division to bounce back next year. Noel, as Brian said, the Giants may have played it poorly, but Saquon actually played it pretty well. He beat the franchise tag. He's gotten more guaranteed money than you know the, the Giants were ever willing to give him. Um, three years, $37.5 million dollars. It's good money for for running back, particularly compared to what we were potentially looking at last year. Um, but it just goes to show Saquon's different because he's he's a, he's such a threat in the passing game, and you know a guy who can average more than fifty yards on the ground and 20, 30 yards in the air consistently every single game. There just aren't that many of them in the league. There's Christian McCaffrey, there's Saquon. I think Josh Jacobs actually is in that category as well. I don't think there's anybody else who's consistently been able to do that over five years. That's the only way to get paid when you're coming out of the backfield in the modern NFL. No, absolutely. Look, we, we know what way the running back market has gone now, and you do need to be a special player if you want to get that kind of the, the top money. Because other than that, teams just look at running backs as disposable, and they, they try to kind of shortchange them where they can. But you, you said that Barkley is he is a special player when he's fit and he's he's on form. You know, he's a dual threat player who can you know he can he can run the ball, he can catch the ball, and I think for the Eagles. 
he he's another exciting piece that they can kind of put in there. And look, we just need to look at how Brian and, and fellow Giants fans have reacted seeing him going there. You know, that's There's what you can tell. A lot of sympathy in the comments here, Brian. It's good to see that the, the people are weighing in. <laughs> Owen's saying, poor Brian. Leash is kind of saying behind that 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 eagles front you know good good luck with that one <laughs> it's it's, it's there's, there's a lot there. of joint there's a lot of saquon barkley jays in, in the house including a a young five-year-old upstairs who actually recognized barkley on the tv earlier and said why is he wearing a green jersey is that an Ireland jersey daddy i said no unfortunately it's not <laughs> no it's not it's an eagles jersey, well, His jersey Ryan, you have a few new dusters now for the house anyway <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> the life isn't always fair conversation <laughs> happens early in the O'Leary household <laughs> born them born them and oh, no look there's other there's other, other running backs to, to focus on here let's let's keep it going <laughs> Now, there are other running backs to, to focus on. And we, as we've said, uh, no, that's been one of the big teams. Um, look, let, let's look at the NFC North because Josh Jacobs has uh, arrived in Green Bay and, and kind of surprisingly had to be a make weight there, but it's it's Aaron Jones. Like Jones has had his injury trouble, no question about it, and he carried a big salary cap hit. And clearly Brian Goodkunst, the GM, has decided there, don't want to take the risk, regardless of how well he played down the stretch and how he was explosive for them in, in the playoffs, let's be fair. Um, is Josh Jacobs an upgrade, though? I'm, I'm kind of wondering all ends up whether they're in a better position than, than than they actually were. Josh Jacobs of every season bar last season, 100%, not arguing that, but last season was, wasn't was by any means a good year for Josh. No, I, I think it's a fair question. And it's to be honest with you, when, when I saw the deal go through, it's a lot of people I saw ask that question, like it, how, how big an upgrade is this really? But I think there's a three-year age difference difference which is something there so maybe you're, you're looking a bit to the future as well but look as a Bears fan Connie you're probably the same I'm, I'm glad to see Aaron Jones out of the division because we've had some torrid torrid games against him it's 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 one I didn't see coming but I mean I can see the logic to it I think LeFleur will have a good offense there I think Jacobs if he can get back going again could be really really productive for the Packers uh, but Aaron Jones will land somewhere, I would imagine, easily. He is a really good player. You talk about injury, so and, and that's something that really affected him. I know last year he actually had to renegotiate his his contract to, to play last season, and I think, obviously, this season they've just looked at it and thought they see someone younger, and maybe that's just the way they, they want to kind of play it now. Now, we'll come back to you in a second on, on DeAndre Swift to the Bears, but, Brian, I just wanted to get your take on Let's roll these two together because, you know, when the Bears – signed deandre swift people were like Oof, 24 million for for three years that looks spicy enough then tony pollard goes to the titans for a very similar figure you know similar type of deal um people hoovering up running backs now and you know as as, as opposed to last season they seem willing to pay for it provided you're the right age profile and um, tony pollard's a couple of years older than, than deandre swift though yeah the pollard one surprised me today um in the sense that he came off a, a he was on the tag last year, he'd come back off a broken leg. I don't think the Cowboys utilized him in the in the manner in which he probably benefits the team. I think he was very complimentary in the sense of the previous year he worked well with Zeke Elliott. He was the lead back last year. It didn't really materialize for him. But yeah, he's gone out today and he's got this contract from the Titans. And the Titans look like they're gonna go in there and try maybe potentially a run orientated um offense which surprised, surprised me because i think one of the reasons why they were looking to get brian callahan as a head coach is that he would look to develop a young quarterback similar to what he done with with joe burrow so that kind of struck me as a bit of a surprise that that one i i'd be a, a little bit opposed because i think josh jacobs is a super signing he was one of the ones i was looking if saquon is to walk i would be very keen to see him come in aaron jones had a fantastic back end of the season and going into the playoffs and it kind of spirals from there in terms of how well he played but over the course of the season he was picking up injuries he came back People said he came back so fresh for the playoffs, but he was banged up for a lot of time. He was banged up the previous season. AJ Dillon, for me, hasn't really progressed to the running back in which they expected. So, no, I think this is a super signing for the Packers. But, you, and but you're looking pa at it being a bounce back, though. I mean, Josh Jacobs phoned it in last season. I know the, the, the Raiders yeah. were poor, but he was terrible. Yeah, he was, yeah. And I think some of the some of the pieces coming out from the Raiders, uh, I think Josh Ann Reed, one of the beat writers that we've had on previously, is suggesting the Raiders have looked at this and Samir White came on really strong towards the back end of the season, so they recognised value. But this is back to the conversation we had time and time again last season, Connor. I know me and Noel have spoken about it offline. You, you, running backs are out there. The value, is, the value of running backs is there, and we've seen you only have to look at the Chiefs. They win the Super Bowl two years in a row with a six, with a six or seven-round pick in Pacheco. You get the right guy, you strike, you struck, you strike gold. And who knows? I've got breaking news for you, Connor. Go on. Breaking news. 
Um, I said, and this might uh, this might relieve the pressure on some Giants fans tonight. Uh, Sheena Tweak, who Colm had on during the uh, offseason, Panthers beat writer, is now doubling down on a conversation which I heard earlier on today. Brian Bournes is due to be traded to the Giants from the Panthers. Um, it looks like a second and fifth round, but the Panthers beat writers are now saying this deal is pretty much done. They're just awaiting the compensation package to be agreed. So there is light at the end of the tunnel for some Giants fans this evening. We can go back to the running back market if you wish, or discuss this one with your call. Well, let's, because because you te- you teed it up nicely there when you were talking about the, the running back market. Noel on on DeAndre Swift. Um, this it's slight slight bit of a head scratcher for me because like let's l- look at what the Bears have done on the last couple of years. They let Dave Montgomery go. Uh, the Lions let DeAndre Swift go. Montgomery goes to the Lions, and all right, they drafted Jamir Gibbs as well, but they seem to have upgraded their backfield. They didn't miss Swift at all, who, to be fair to him, had a career year last year, selected to the Pro Bowl. Um, but it, it's, to Brian's point, it's still a lot of money to pay a running back, and it's continued a bit of a trend that's emerged with Ryan Poles in Chicago, the GM, where he seems to spend money on non-premium position. He put a lot of money into the linebackers last year when other teams weren't, and now he's paying big money for a running back. When actually the Bears, it's one position that they've, pretty good at drafting and developing in terms of the likes of you know, Tariq Cohen, Khalil Herbert, who's there now. They, they've generally picked up bargains in the running back market, but they've swung for defences with this one. Yeah, it's, it's it's a little bit of a strange one. I mean, I think Swift is a good player. I was, I was talking to Brian offline beforehand, and the first thing that came across when I saw it to me was, I mean, I like the move. I think he's a good player. I think he will be productive, but it was just kind of, mm, I, I, it didn't jump at me for, for whatever reason. I don't know. I mean, it when you look at the backfield they'd have there, now maybe they're looking at the fact that, you know, a lot of yards over the last couple of years were put up by Justin Fields. So maybe if Fields is not going to be here next year, you want to get another kind of productive running back in who can help kind of put those yards in. Herbert found himself injured there last season. You know, maybe there's something in that. Maybe they kind of want an insurance policy. Roshan Johnson was touted really, really highly, but last year wasn't, I guess, what people had expected from him. But he can probably continue to develop. But I think going forward, when you look at this Bears team, Swift will probably be considered the number one back. But I think you will see all of them at times kind of, you know, you'll have that running back by committee kind of rotate. So it, it's going to be interesting. I mean, look, it's, it's not the, the biggest money in the world for a running back. And as you say, he, he did have a productive season last year and he is a player who can catch the ball as, as well as run. So it could be a good move. And he's a young player, so he could potentially be here for a number of years if they can kind of get that right. So, yeah, like I'm, I'm not against the move. I do like it. I do think he's a good player, but it just wasn't one. I guess I was looking for something bigger in free agency to jump out at me as a Bears fan, but it's it's good. I, th- I think it's good. I think it'll I think it'll be productive. Brian, let's talk about a couple of defensive players. We focused on one side of the ball almost exclusively so far, and, and one of the bigger ones really kind of resetting the non-Aaron Donald market for, for interior uh, d- defensive linemen, Christian Wilkins to the Raiders. As you know, you know me, I, I judge players primarily by how good they are when they're mic'd up. And Christian Wilkins is absolute mileage when, when, when he's mic'd up. He's one of my favorite players, but also happens to be a very good defensive lineman in fairness, which is why he's got a $110 million deal. A nice pair to put alongside Max Crosby. I imagine that will uh, re-energize a lot of the, the Raiders players defensively. The, the Raiders are going to need a big bounce back uh, season. I think Tom Telesco going in there as well. Obviously, the pressure of finishing with the charges, and then he, he jumps... To another team within the division, I think he had to come out from a, from a personal standpoint and make a big splash. And this is arguably one of the biggest. You could suggest this is the biggest one of today. I know Kirk Cousins and various different other outlets will probably suggest other players, but this one's huge. I mean, he's arguably the best player, most highly sought after defensive player. And if he, when he's on his day, he's, he's fantastic. But unfortunately, this is a, the problem which the Dolphins have put themselves into, and it's led to a situation where they just couldn't continue to try, I suppose evaluate where they are in terms of is it defensive players or is it offensive line players in which they want to secure I've seen in the last last there are so many players which were suggested would move on from them have now recontracted from an offensive line perspective ultimately i think it was one shot too many he's such a big player with a big contract coming from what's it, what are you quoting 110 million over four yeah. or five years i know like again you get into the devil of the detail it probably does it does an opt-out after a period of time but i mean the raiders have been here before when they've Throwing a big contracts to players, and you know they've, as you said, they've mailed it in, and that, but and imagine this is an opportunity for them to go in there. And let's bear in mind, Antonio Pierce is for me arguably one of the best linebackers to play the game back in the day. Obviously, my love for the Giants probably shining through there, but it's a good pair to work under, and imagine he will get get the best out of these guys. 
Now, we tend to focus on one side of the ledger and talk about the team signing players, but I think the Wilkins deal, when you combine it with Robert Hunt, um, also leaving the Dolphins to go to the Packers for for $100 million, their, their offensive guard. Dolphins were one of seven teams going into free agency who were uh, projected to have a bit of cap trouble. They got to get deals for Jalen Waddle done and a Tua Tungvaloa extension as well. So they got a plan for that. Uh, and that means taking some pain and letting some key pieces go. Wilkins and Hunter are two guys that you would like to have had around in the trenches on, on both sides of the ball. Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, this this is, you know, when people say, oh, the cap doesn't matter. The cap does matter. It'll, it'll always catch you down the road at some point. And, you know, this is why teams have windows and they need to do things within those windows before things like this happen. And that's just the way the game is. I mean, look, these are two players who absolutely you would love to keep at whatever team you're at. For me, I was saying to Brian as well earlier, I was... I knew the Bears wouldn't, but I was just praying that Wilkins was was in play for them just to, to bring him in there. But unfortunately, no, didn't seem to happen. But yeah, th- th- this is what happens with the cap. You know, you, you you plan it out and if it doesn't hit when you want it to hit, then you end up having to just kind of refresh it out and start again. And that's where the Dolphins are now. As you say, they have other deals to get done. So this is just the reality of the game. Brian, there weren't too many premium pass rushers available, as I remember, in free agency last year. This year, there seems to be a couple knocking around. Um, Jonathan Greenard picked up by the Vikings four-year deal. He had a really good season in in Houston last year. wasn't always the, the headline grabber, but a you know solid, solid production to put up mile. Yeah, absolutely. See, the Vikings have seemed to have gone down the Texans route today. They got they took in Blake Cashman as well, another linebacker from the Texans. I don't know whether they. Looked at, you know, certain, you see, I remember last year, the Orlando, uh, who does the Falcons, suggested that the Falcons would go heavily and very strongly on one particular team, and that was the Saints. And it looks like the, the Vikings have kind of gone this route as well. They've gone after players directly from one team. I don't know if they're trying to kind of merge them together and hoping they can, you know, get lightning in the bottle again from two players that were so effective and so dominant. Last week, they were suggesting he would be one of the underrated players in terms of going into free agency. And whoever was to pick up, Green Air would, would get a smashing player. I think it was 78 million has been quoted over three or four years. So he's got what he wanted. But um, interesting to see what the Vikings do. The Vikings have gone leaning very heavily on, on defense so far today. I know it's early days and we're only four or five hours in. So, but they still got a, a conundrum now around quarterback and what they're going to do now with the Kirk Cousins departure. But certainly two players that really, really effective season for the Texans. It'd be interesting if they can continue to trend when, once they hit Minnesota. No, we mentioned that the Packers earlier and what they were doing on the offensive side of the ball, but now they've brought in Xavier McKinney from the from the Giants on the other side as well. Like they, they, it's clear they mean business, and and why wouldn't they? Youngest roster in the NFL, you know, outperformed, you know, from a, the point of view of a lot of outsiders in the playoffs last year. Came within a whisker of down in the 49ers and onto the championship game, um, and and they're they're coming out swinging in free agency. Yeah, no, they, they absolutely seem to to have a purpose now today, looking at the, the moves they've made. Um, as you said, we, we talked about they went running back. They they dropped someone, brought someone in, paid big money. They're going to do that again now, as you say, at safety. And yeah, I think these Packers, a young team, they they probably overachieved last year from what a lot of us thought they would do. And they look like they they don't want to let that slip and they want, they want to build on that. And I think the NFC North as a whole looks like it could be a really competitive division this year. A lot of teams, you just mentioned the Vikings there, the Lions did what they did last year, and and hopefully the Bears are improving. So this NFC North looks like it's it's really developing into something that could be a, a tough a tough division to win. A casualty of the 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 Packers on the on the way out, Brian, is is David Bakhtiari on his day one of the best offensive linemen in, in, in the NFL has had real, real difficulty with, with injury over the last couple of seasons. And and you hate to see it, but it was an obvious move and one that we, you know, was really, it was about when rather than, rather than if. And if 20.9 million, I think was the number being quoted today. I think it's in around 15 around in terms of cap savings for them. Inevitable being called out for weeks. For me, it's, it was more of a way he was going to end up. Is it a, another a quick uh, flight to New York? And he, you know, he, Strikes up another relationship with Aaron Rodgers. He obviously are very quite friendly from the days in Green Bay, but like it's a clear, a clear name for the Jets. You know, I know it, it makes sense. And, you know, he's he's one of the stellar linemen within the league on the offensive side, so it does make sense. Jets need a lot of action, but it probably would be. You are, you, know, are you suggesting that Aaron Rodgers needs him to protect him, or that they'll both be in the treatment room for the whole season next year? I, well, Aaron Rodgers is going to need someone to protect him, but unfortunately, like Aaron Rodgers seems to be the one we've seen over the last week. We're not going to. Are we going to go with Asher? Go for it. I'll go for it. He said last week he's going to play for the next four years. 
And again, Jets fans over the, over the past week have again have been suggesting who's who's the GM here? Is it, is it Joe Douglas or is it Aaron Rodgers? But if Aaron Rodgers gets his way, I imagine David Bakhtiari will be getting an opportunity to at least come in and negotiate a contract with the Jets. They do need an offensive line. They need backup. They've, they've had a number of injuries last year. We saw the unfortunate how unfortunate it was a quarterback, even for the the Wilson the Zach Wilson experience. But it makes sense for him to go there. But again, for the Packers, rootless today. Time to move him on. Darnell Savage has gone to the Jags. A good pickup for the Jags, but again, a player they've recognized there's a better safety out there. We're going to go get X McKinney, and Darnell Savage has moved on to the Jags, so he obviously knew his cards were marked there as well. Fine singing voice on David Bakhtiari as well, as anyone who's seen Pitch Perfect 2 will know himself, and Clay Matthews on the a cappella team and the, the sing off that's revealing way too much about what I do in my spare time when I'm not watching the NFL. But great movie, underrated movie, pitch perfect too. And um, cu- couple of interesting moves in terms of uh, players who haven't yet moved on, Noel, and, and one indeed who looks like he's going to be locked down uh, by his existing team, Michael Pittman Jr. Colts look like they're finalizing a three year deal to keep him in Indy. And um, that's a key piece. They'll hope to have Anthony Richardson back, fire and fit. Um, you know, showed really well in his couple of games last year before going down to injury. And that's somebody that they would have been very keen. You you, you don't let a guy like that go if there's any chance of, uh, of keeping him on your roster. No, absolutely. He had a really good season last year. And as you say, David, a young rookie quarterback who will be coming back from injury. And I mean, when we saw the franchise tag on Pittman, you kind of knew it was just a, a placeholder that they, they would be working on a deal. Because as you say, you don't let young talent like that go. You try to, to build with that and put more kind of targets around that young quarterback and, and Pittman looks like a player who could go on and develop um, I don't think he's quite at that top top level yet as a as a wide receiver but he is still a guy who can be absolutely productive and can really get your quarterback out of trouble when he needs it and yeah he looks like a player who will be in Indy now for, for quite a while to come judging by the reports coming out in terms of what deal it looks like they're about to agree uh, we're talking about a player who was franchise tagged and looks like he's staying, Brian. Franchise tagged and wants out, on the other hand, is, is T. Higgins at the Bengals. Like something always had to give there between Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and Tyler Boyd. Um, I don't think a lot of people would like in Cincinnati for it to be T. Higgins who makes his way out the door, but that's where he wants to go. Yeah, um, it doesn't come as a surprise. We saw it over the course of the last week. Um, you know, there's kind of rumblings coming out that he wasn't happy with the tag. Most players, like Nolan suggests, Pittman's worked that well. He's been tagged with a view to a trip, with a view to a deal. There's a lot of players who it's a bit of breathing room for both the GM and the team to kind of, I suppose, negotiate the, the finer points of a deal. But with T. Higgins, it looks like it's quite the opposite. It looks like there's no deal in place. There doesn't seem to be any kind of compromise in terms of where where they're at and where they want to get to. Uh, I saw Tyler Boyd was suggesting as someone who wasn't going to be returning. So when I saw that, I said. Okay, that makes sense, and that they will find a way to navigate a deal. I wonder if he kind of playing his cards early here. I don't really want to get traded, but I'll I'll put the ask in because ultimately I want to to get paid. And uh, but it's a brave move because I don't think the Bengals are going to give him what he wants ultimately. And it's a bit like uh, Sneed with the with the Chiefs franchise tag, but a view to a trade. But ultimately, is he going to get the trade or is he going to be back with the Chiefs? It's a it's a game of poker for both both sides of it. But uh, the Bengals probably knew this was coming. I think they'll find a way to navigate this one. Right there, we leave it for our first segment, uh, our first look at uh, Free Agent Frenzy. Let's get a look now um, in our second segment of the uh, Free Agent Window uh, into some of the deals that have been done before March 11th as teams move to lockdown and uh, some of their otherwise would-be free agents before they hit the market. And Noel, there's a clutch of fairly eye-catching deals to look over. Um, Chiefs were, were, were quite active in, in who they kept in the building um, Drew Tranquil, Chris Jones, and Legarius Sneed now all locked down, all uh, key pieces, and, and, and interesting which side of the ball they've been active on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the first thing that jumps out with you is that Chris Jones deal. I mean, what a what a deal he got himself there. But I mean, I think even though they didn't franchise tag him, I think he made it very clear where he wanted to be. Uh, and the Chiefs, you just knew he he's there, Patrick Mahomes, on the defensive side of the ball. Um, so that was something that wasn't surprising, although the deal itself was eye water and fair play to him. Uh, Brian talked about Sneed there being franchise tagged. For me, that, that always felt like they weren't going to keep him and this was a way to maybe look to, to get him traded. And I still think that's something that may happen. I think he's going to be playing it's 19 million for the, the franchise tag for him there this season. I don't think 
well, he could end up there, but I don't think that's the plan to actually have him there. I think there probably will be someone who will be willing to give the the, the trade uh, compensation for him. He had a really, really good season and, you know, they win the Super Bowl and maybe his stock is never going to be higher. But overall, I think the Chiefs, yeah, you look at the defense, there's, there's a lot kind of going on there at the moment. And yeah, once they get Chris Jones, I think, as I say, he is the, he is the leader of that defense. I mean, you get him sorted, um, you know, they have good players there and I think they'll be strong there next season just as they were this year. I think if it wasn't for that final drive in the Super Bowl, I think Chris Jones might have actually had a decent chance of being Super Bowl MVP. He was unbelievable in, in that game in Vegas as well. He's he's an absolutely um he's an absolute gem of a player. Brian, um another team very active. I, I love the NFC South, as you know. I love the old slow bicycle race. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Bucks are never, running never, it back. They got Baker never. Mayfield, Mike Evans, and now Antoine Will- Winfield all locked down. I mean the, <laughs> the Bucks are winning playoff place. Yeah. You can go out in the first round, but you still got to the dance. The books are winning the off season. Is that what was suggested last night? I read. Uh, <laughs> I was watching the uh, the lead up the free en- free agency frenzy, as they call it, on the NFL Network, and they were suggesting the books won the off season before teams even got into signing or agreeing deals today. Baker's back. I sorry if I, to, to interrupt you, but I was just laughing thinking. You look at the way the AFC, the way the playoffs finished last year, and like you've after the season the Ravens had, they're like we've got Lamar Jackson MVP. All this talent on both sides of the ball, and we still got rolled over by by the Chiefs. Josh Allen sitting at home watching after after going out, similar fashion. <laughs> the books are running it back with Baker Mayfield. It's <laughs> all they got to do. You don't have to outrun the Tiger. You just have to outrun the guy next to you in the in the NFC side. <laughs> The eye of the tiger is what someone suggested uh, Baker has found. Because let's be fair, this time last year he looked like he was a spent force. People had given up on him. The Bucks gave him that opportunity. He has proven himself over the course of the year. He played really well in the back end of the season, which kind of surprised me. And they, with all due respect, the Eagles were gone at that stage, but they still went out and put a, put a marker down. And I felt he played quite well in, in, in Detroit. I think ultimately they came up against a team that was just a little bit better than him. And, you know, I, I think I still think back to that great drive leading up to halftime where he went 91 yards and he has that great throw to Mike Evans and they get back in the game. He proved himself time and time again last year when it looked like he was there. The contract did surprise me. I, I, won't, I won't lie, I thought it was a bit, bit aggressive from the books, but then they're probably looking at it from a standpoint of, and we've had this conversation, where did they go if they don't sign Baker Mayfield? Because Baker Mayfield, by all accounts, had potential opportunities to go to New England and even Atlanta were in the mix because the Orlando suggested six weeks ago the Falcons were very keen to have a, have a conversation with him. Mike Evans is back. They've struck up a great relationship. And on the defensive side, obviously, they've tagged um, Antoine Winfield Jr. with a view again, similar scenario to what we discussed there. I mean, has got a view to getting a deal done, and it looks more like they will, as opposed to him being disappointed by being tagged. You could argue they're rightly favourites, even though it's only March. But as I said, now earlier on the show, the Falcons have brought in one of the the, the gunslingers from the from the uh, the NFL and Kirk Cousins. They might have a different opinion on this, but look, Bucks have won the off season. That's what we. That, that's wrong with that. <laughs> No, it was a good start to the off season for the for the Bears. That one of the players they needed to lock down was was Jalen Johnson. They initially franchise tagged him, but then uh, managed to come to terms. And looks like one of those rare win wins. A good deal for both sides. Doesn't break the bank from the Bears' perspective. It's about as well as you're going to do for a cornerback of that level of talent. And he's happy to stay. Yeah, I was actually delighted to see that deal when it got done because I know last season. Jalen Johnson was talking about, you know, I, I wasn't looking to reset the market. I just wanted to get a deal done. He wanted to stay at the Bears. Then he kind of was given permission to look for a trade. And But we knew the Bears didn't really want to trade him, so they kind of put his value high. So to, to see the deal they got done this time, in fairness to him, he didn't reset the cornerback market, even though he had a really, really good season and he could have pushed for possibly more. This looks like a really good deal for both sides. A player who clearly wants to stay at the Bears, who is now seen as, I know they brought in, Kevin Byard there, who will be experienced, but other than him, he was the that main guy in that defensive uh, backs room now. And Eddie Jackson retired. Jalen Johnson is one of those experienced pros that the, these young guys can look up to. So he got that sorted, and it didn't break the bank for the Bears. A player who's happy at a team where he's at got a good contract. A team that really wanted to keep him and got a good deal on that contract. And I think, yeah, I, I never had to worry though. I, I always felt that this franchise tag again, as we talked about other players, was a placeholder. Both parties seemed to want to get it done. I just, I was afraid because Johnson had had such a good season, 
maybe his expectations of what he should get would have crept up a bit and that might have caused a bit of a problem but seemingly not they they, they got it done and i mean there's happy days so far anyway Brian, happy days for the Ravens as well, who got a deal done with uh, Justin Matabike, who's, you know, a player I'm I glad you, I'm glad you. I'm glad you announced, pronounced it because I wasn't going there. Walk, walk past him, you know, sorry, name drop here, mind your toes. Walk past him when we were in the Mandalay Bay in, in Vegas. That is a large human being. Like, <laughs> if he's negotiating for me on the other side of the table, I give him whatever he wants. $98 million done, no problem. You should have been chasing them. You should have been chasing them like the way I do with uh, Joshua Dobbs. Find someone who's a little bit smaller and easier to ke- to keep up with. That's that's the best way to go with these go with these things. Look, he was a fantastic for the Ravens last year. I think the Ravens have recognised uh, very much to what we we spoke about last off season. They know they're in a very strong position. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be in terms of the championship game. There's such a hoodoo on their playoff performances and for Lamar, unfortunately. But you know, right now you can still argue even if they weren't to go out there and make any major splashes this off season. They would still be up there, and I suppose the focus for them was trying to make sure they keep the players in house. Um, that's I suppose were a part of the bigger picture there last year in terms of how well they were offensive and defense. Was just in terms of the Ravens want to show out there. Gus Edwards is, is gone to the Chargers, which was announced just just prior to us coming on, and to, that's a bit of a that for me that's a bit of bit of a loss. I know we spoke about the the running back committee in which they had over the course of the season, and there was various players that stepped up, but he was kind of the forefront for large parts of the season. So interesting to see how they, they react to that. And he obviously would have been one of the key players in terms of blocking for the running back. So big player to bring back. Um, and the Ravens will, I suppose, sit tight and see what, what comes in the draft more so than free agency for me. The Jags, no, obviously didn't end last season the way they would have wanted it to, really fell apart down the stretch. But, you know, one guy who didn't fall apart was Josh Allen, who they franchise tag now. Key part of that defense, you know, I think was their sack leader last year and one of the sack leaders in the in the NFL. Um, he may not be the highest paid player named Josh Allen in the NFL, but for his position, he's going to get decent money. Yeah, no, look, that's a player you don't want to be losing. Uh, the, the Jags are a team that... You know, they, they came a couple of years ago, they were they were down there, they got Trevor Lawrence, and then they kind of made that kind of step up and step up. And players like Josh Allen are players that, you know, when you want to keep that development going, you want to keep them in-house and, and get them sorted. So it, it's a big move for the Jags, and it's, it's important for them to keep players like that, to keep that development and that building moving forward for them. Seven and a half, sorry, Connor. Seven and a half sacks last year. Like that's huge yeah. numbers. You can't, you can't, you can't let no, that walk you, out. You can't lose a player like that. No, absolutely. but it, it, it's a good point when you raise it, Noel. And that you know we talk about dysfunctional franchises do dysfunctional things, but functional functional franchises you got to be able to bring guys in and hang on to them. You know to keep that culture in the locker room. You know we see the likes of the Ravens, the Packers, the Steelers. Those teams consistently do that. They know when to let players go, but they also know which ones they really want to hold on to. It's not just about performances on the field, although you certainly couldn't argue that Josh Allen didn't produce on the field. But it's also about you know showing players coming into the NFL that you know you 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 put in the shift here and you'll be rewarded and we'll extend you. We won't we won't we won't wait for somebody else to pay you. No, absolutely. But that's why you know all all the teams have the same salary caps and the same draft. But it's the same teams that they'll be at the top all the time. And that's because well-run teams, you know, take care of the top players when they should take care of them. You know, ideally you want to obviously be taking care of your your, your players that you've drafted. But even when you do bring in someone in free agency who's a good player, you know, you make sure you get them locked up. And that is why good teams do good things and, and other teams flounder at the bottom like season after season. Same with the Jags, Brian. And I know t- technically it's not a free agent move because it was a trade, but um, Mac Jones going from the Patriots to the Jags was one of the more interesting kind of footnote uh, deals to happen um, in, in in this window. What do we make of that from from both sides of it? Clearly, he needs a he needs a fresh start, um, but he's not going to see ac- action anytime soon unless something happens to the golden haired one. Yeah, I kind of feel sorry for him in a way. He's gone from a quarterback that in his first year was playing a playoff game, well beaten comprehensively by the Bills, to where essentially yesterday it wasn't even much of a storyline, the fact that he, there was a trade made and he, he goes for a lesser round pick. Like he, I think he's recognised he's going to have to go there. And I don't know, he may, maybe he's modelling that on other quarterbacks around the league who take a year out essentially, go to a different team, play back up and hope they can find another opportunity. You know, Vince, Mitch Trubisky springs to mind, not because I'm sitting here with two Bears fans, but... When when he went to free agency two years ago to the Steelers and there was a there was a market for him, including the Giants for trying to get him in, it was a highly sought after market because he was arguably the best quarterback on the market. 
and yet he only played a couple of snaps for the Bills. You just wonder, some, you know, is a Mac Jones next year finding a way to navigate a move back to a team where he gets an opportunity to play? But he knows the area. He's obviously that's that's his local area. Maybe it suits him to go back home and I suppose reevaluate where he are, where he is in his career. But he, as you said, he's not going to get an opportunity unless unless Trevor gets injured, which in fairness has happened quite a few times over the course of the last two years. But Players sorry, who went guys, into sorry no. So I was going to say, how strange is it? In 2021, we had these five quarterbacks, and we we knew Trevor Lawrence would be number one. But of the other four, it was like who'll go where? And now suddenly, two of them are on the one roster together in Jones and Lawrence. It's, it's amazing how quickly it just kind of it can go downhill for a player. Another point I was going to make, actually, and you, you've you've teed it up nicely for me there. Now the the players who went in the first round of that draft: Lawrence, Trey Lance, Justin Fields. Mac Jones and there's one one other one I missed. Zach, Zach Wilson. Wilson. Not one of them has a winning record in the NFL over their their five seasons since. For all the talk I, that there was around that that draft class and kind of you know should bring chills to the uh, the, the the hairs on the back of the neck of GMs looking at this year's draft and all the talk about Caleb Williams and Drake May and loaded draft and all that doesn't always pan out the way you think it will. And how many of them are going to start next year? Realistically, is it one? Trevor Lawrence. Like Zach Wilson's going to be moved on. Justin Fields is in an enigma. We'll go with that. You know, we don't know where he's going to end up. We spoke about it. We don't know right now where he's going to end up. Mac Jones, obviously, his, his hand has been declared. He's going to be a backup at best in, in Jacksonville. It's it's not a, a draft that many will look back for, look back on in terms of a glowing reference for quarterbacks. And like the Jets essentially went with him on the back of his pro day, but they're, they're paying for it now still. But uh, yeah, certainly just goes to show, and it goes to show that no matter what you look at in the draft, and we get carried away come draft time, I'm looking forward to doing the draft coverage at years next month. But we will nitpick and we will evaluate a quarterback next month who gets selected, whether it's a JJ McCarthy on the rise. And in two or three years, we'll be looking back going, Do you remember Lamar went 32 in the first round and he's arguably one of the best quarterbacks in the league? You just never know. No, true that. Um, that's pretty much all the deals that have been done or the, the, the eye-catching ones so far. And we're kind of keeping an eye on the, the Twitter machine because they're rolling in all the time. But, you know, let's move on and, and, and look in our remaining segment that those who uh, blue chip free agents who are still on the market. Um, and I, I'd imagine some of these won't be there for too long. Let's start with a defensive player, Brian. Daniil Hunter. Um, we talked about there being not many opportunities to get an edge rusher of, of this caliber. Um People be snapping the, the 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 Vikings hand off or snapping his hand off if the Vikings uh, can't get a deal done. Yeah, as when the greener the deal got announced today, a lot of people felt straight away okay, that that spells, spells the end for for Hunter, and, and inevitably we'll get some kind of breaking news within a couple of hours that he's secured a deal with another team and it hasn't transpired yet. I'd be interested to see does the market hot up even later on this evening or or tomorrow. And I I genuinely thought the Giants have been. Very uh, outspoken in terms of the, the beat runners, and um, even Bron- even Joe Shane at the uh, the at the uh, convoy in terms of his press conference that they were keen to go after a defensive end and an edge rusher, and he was suggested. But obviously, if the Brian Bourne's deal is to materialise, he's he's out of picture there. It'd be interesting to see where he goes because there's been so many other moves today that you thought they were certain teams that might be in, you know, down in the pecking order from it hasn't transpired. It's 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 a surprise because he's been a really effective player over the course of the, the last couple of years and the, and the kind of player that most fans will want on their team. No, um Calvin Ridley, another one who's a, who's a free agent this season. You know, we talked about some moves that the Jags had made and players that they brought in. Um don't know what's going to happen with, uh, with with Ridley though. He's been a little bit of an enigma. At times looked like he had a really good, you know, particularly in the early games, really good connection with uh, with, with with Trevor Lawrence. Yes, he did. It's, it actually is going to be very interesting to see where he does end up. I mean, we look at the wide receiver market now, and there are a few players out there. But then I think the draft will probably play a part in this as well. The draft, obviously, when you you look at the wide receivers re- available. It seems like a lot of people in the know think that this is a really, really strong class when it comes to wide receivers. So maybe, you know, maybe people are going to leave those receivers out there in free agency, maybe into the next wave, maybe push that money down a little bit. And then someone like Ridley, who can be a very good player, he's still young, could go in there and, and do a job. But again, it's it's just interesting because you, you do have to factor in how the draft does play a part and how teams actually spend their free agency money. And maybe there is a bit of kind of game plan in there on, on what way these receivers work out. Because I don't think there's been too many receivers go today, has there? But... 
Well, I was just going to say, Gabe Davis went to went to the Gabe Jags. Da- yeah. it, it's, it's the one off the top of my head. Jerry Judy obviously moved, but that was a trade rather rather than free agency. Again, like last year, there 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 aren't there's not much value to be had in the wide receiver market by the looks. I think that there's wide receivers out there. If you're looking to completely revitalize and and send your wide receiving core to the next level, I don't think there's many players in free agency that can do that for you. Maybe there, there's one or two in there, as I say, in the later wave of the free agency who can come in and you know, give you a bit of a boost or kind of solidify a wide receiving uh, room that little bit. But I think in terms of like actually changing the wide receiver room, teams will probably look to some of those players in the draft who are being really, really highly touted. The other one who's potentially on the market, Brian, is uh, is Hollywood Brown, Marquise Brown, whose uh, last known address was in Arizona. Uh, Arizona, I know they've had a couple of a couple of signings today, but by and large, they're, they're very quiet. There's not a lot coming out of Arizona at the moment. It'd be interesting to see if, if he, you know, is able to navigate it away out there. Still, still years later, still shocked that the Ravens decided to to make that move. Uh, the Gabe Davis one is really the only standout one. I was even looking through the tracker that we have available to us that we've, you know, put together, and he's the only wide receiver that's really is popping on the list. So. The Jags has obviously made that decision. He's the man, and, and Calvin really will find the home. Patriots has been suggested, but you might see some of the players traded as opposed to free agency acquisitions and pickups. I know they, it's also reported that the, uh, the Pats are trying to trade Schuster and, and various other different wide receivers that they have within the organization. So maybe we'll see a few trades happening as opposed to the pickups. But no, it's touched on it there. You look at this draft next month and just talk, we're talking about potentially four or five wide receivers going in the first round, and certainly three going in the top ten. Arguably with neighbors and the Dunze and um, the other one escapes escapes me off the top Harrison, of my head. Oh, Marvin, Harrison, Marvin, yeah. Marvin. How did I forget Marvin? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but like them three are certainly going to go in the top ten. And then there's a few others that could potentially be gone by the end of the first round. I think teams are going to recognise there's a lot of players. There's a lot of players in play come this draft, even in the second round. Let's look at a couple of players and uh, from a couple of teams that haven't particularly been active so far, keeping their powder dry at this stage. Um, Stefan Gilmore, cornerback with the, with the Cowboys. I don't think the Cowboys have made any moves so far. They've been uh, no, very quiet by Cowboys standards. I've lost a couple of players as well. Uh, obviously, Pollard running back on. They've lost a couple of players to the Commanders. Uh, Dan Quinn has obviously gone back to where he was working, taking the, their centre. He's gone to the Commanders and is another defensive player. Gone over there as well. Get the name escapes me, but again, they've lost a couple today. Be interested to see how they react. We spoke about this time and time again. Kind of like the Cowboys see themselves as a team that are very much in the mix and feel they should be in the, you know, on the periphery of going to sit ball. They don't see the need to be going aggressive in free agency. I think they see it as more of a let's tweak here and there, put ourselves in a position next season. So it doesn't surprise me that they're not out there being very proactive. I don't know whether they want to be making these big splashes. Jerry Jones. Has alluded to that over the course of the last week. We'll do teams the Cowboys' way. Sometimes the Cowboys' way is the most erratic way. But right now it looks like Jerry Jones watching them get their clock cleaned at home by the by the Packers in the playoffs. Yeah, I think he might be looking at the bigger picture over the course of the season. He certainly <laughs> suggested that when he, he said I wasn't going to make any knee jerk reactions so to Mike McCarthy's position. He's going to remain as head coach. He feels that they had such a strong season that that game was that miss. They- the, the team that built them, that beat them, is going tooling up in free agency, and the team that loses is uh, is sitting on its hands. Anyway, that's that's for another day's discussion. Um, another team that hasn't done much so far is the is the Lions, Noel and Shauncey Gardner Johnson potentially available as a free agent. There's a couple of safeties have uh, have moved so far. Brandon Jones, um, one that springs to mind. Um, Kevin Byard, obviously another one. The the, the Bears signed Byard, and uh, there's, there's there's a market for Shauncey Gardner Johnson if the Lions don't resign him. Oh yeah, no, you, you would absolutely think there would be a market for him out there, but the Lions themselves have, have stayed quiet, but as you say, we looked at them last season and what they've done, so they don't have too many holes there that they need to fix, so maybe they think they can do it in the draft. Sneed was someone who I thought could be, you know, could they take a chance on, on maybe trading for him, depending on obviously what the, the Chiefs want, um, and maybe they could get someone in there to, to help Hutchinson with the, with the pass rush, but other than that, the Lions look like a solid team they've done a great job there they're a young enough team i think they're going to be haunting us for a few years to come yeah connor in, in the nfc north but uh yeah it, again it'll be interesting to see what they do maybe they feel like they don't need to spend that big money at the, the fourth wave of free agency but maybe they can fill a few holes maybe in the second or third wave or as you say then maybe in the draft and like the royal rumble in the wwe who comes in from parts unknown but colin crown and welcome colin Obviously, celebrating Killian Murphy's Oscar win all day, so you you, you had to had to arrive a, li- a little bit late, like all the best Cork people, of course. Colin and Killian Murphy live in Dublin. Um, 
But we, we we saved all the best Broncos news for, for you, Colin, and not least the fact that you've hit the road, Jack, with uh, with Russell Wilson, who's now gone to the Steelers. Uh, yeah, um, I, I was uh, chatting to Bill Barnwell from ESPN. The time change when when we planned that the the time change meant that I thought it was I was going to be able to join you guys and then go into that. But they jo- they, they go earlier in in the states, so people have that to look forward to tomorrow. I had a couple of very interesting uh, conversations uh, with with him, um, and he. I, I suppose the interesting thing in from a Russ perspective is in some ways, Connor, like last year's Steelers or the last couple of years, the Steelers have tended to throw to the sideline, sidelines. And so it made sense. But Arthur Smith is a guy who likes to use the middle of the field. And if you take a look at Arthur Smith and his teams over the last, say, three years or so, generally his QBs have tended to throw to the middle of the field somewhere between 13 to 15 percent of the time. Russ through to the middle of the field uh, 5.8% of the time last year. Russ also didn't tend to throw beyond um, the line of scrimmage all that frequently. He, and and That's because Russell can't see over the line though, right? Isn't that yes. a small quarterback conundrum? You don't open that, up the middle of the field if you can't see over the six foot eight defensive lineman with the arms as long as his legs. That That is one of the, the interesting um, things to see how the Steelers utilize that. They obviously have, you know, in George Pickens, they've a guy who can make spectacular catches. They have a run game there. They have a pretty solid O line um, and they're not paying Russ a whole lot of money. They have a well-established coach as well. So it's not going to be a Nathaniel Hackett situation where, you know, somebody doesn't know how to, to use them. So, I, I mean, I don't see any reason why if Russ is, to, he, if he still has it and he went on and he had the fireside chat uh, with Brandon Marshall and he said he wants another two, um, you know, Lombardi trophies. Well, there's no excuses, I think, now for Russ, right? Because he, he's going to a, a head coach who's never had a losing season. So um, the, pre- the pressure won't be there because he, they're paying him a million and a half, right? The Broncos are playing the, re- the rest of it so the expectations are going to be tempered by that so I think if if Russ is to do it this is his best opportunity since he left Seattle Connor just a quick one the, if you look at say suggest, suggesting he is the backup to Kenny Pig which I don't believe he will become September I know we're miles away but he Mr. bitsky has gone back to the bills at 2.75 million and Russ is earning 1.21 million on the, on the minimum salary I'm genuinely surprised that there's not more teams out there that are make they didn't want to suggest an opportunity to even have a conversation. I know the Giants potentially were in the mix, and, and I had no issue with the, with the suggestion that he would come in and challenge Daniel Jones because it would make sense, and I think it totally makes sense for the Steelers. I'd argue it would have even made sense for the Raiders. Obviously, they've gone a different route and signed Gardner Minshew this evening, and that deal has been quoted at 25 million over two years. So, is Gardner Minshew going to go into the Raiders and? Expect to be a backup on that kind of money. I would, I would argue, he wouldn't. He would think he'd be, he'd be starting a quarterback, and they're picking a tour thing. I don't think they can get up to get a quarterback. I, I'm genuinely surprised, despite the, the two years in which he's had in Denver, there weren't more teams in the mix coming in. A couple of big players, and um, still with with question marks over them, or you know, a, a few that we haven't actually touched on yet. And, and one of them, Noel, is uh, is Derek Henry. Where do we think Derek Henry's going to end up? Yeah, that could be an interesting one. I was, I was kind of thinking maybe Derrick Henry could fit in the Chargers, but I, I, they've made a move there now, so that's not going to happen. I know Greg Roman likes to, to run the ball a bit. But, I mean, Derrick Henry feels like one of those running backs. He's he's like a shooting star. He's he's all bright and he's amazing, but then he just goes, burns out and goes over the cliff. And I wonder if maybe he's kind of hit that point now. Uh, it'll be interesting to see, though, if somebody does bring him in to actually see if he is still, the, you know, the, the King Henry of, of a couple of years ago, kind of running over over defenders and, and dragging players with him. Um, but where he ends up now is, is, is going to be interesting. And again, because of this whole running back thing, we'll kind of wait and see how it all kind of pans out. You've got people like Eckler out there as well, who maybe could command a bit of attention going forward. But yeah, it's it's... It's, it's a strange one because, you know, not too long ago, if you'd have said Derek Henry would have been free and a free agent, you know, people would have been lapping him up. But that's how quickly things really, really change for these running backs. And Brian, it's not just with Henry, the you know, decline in production, which we've seen, but it's it's an awful lot of touches. You know, the t- Titans really look to squeeze every single drop that they could out, out of Henry. It's a punishing schedule that uh, that he's had, particularly last year. Yeah, I, mean, I still think back to when we went to London to watch him firsthand against the Ravens and 
you were I think you were taken back more than I was in terms of his how his production in that game, how he looked completely off from Kilter and compared to what we saw over the course of the last three or four years. We I'll throw out a team, I think this one makes a lot of sense for me. It's the Ravens and like Gus Edwards has just moved on to the charges as no one has alluded to, to there. And we're talking about a team that has a, a running back by committee type format there. Would it pursue him to go in there and not, not necessarily be declared as the number one back? He's there, you know, you've got JK Dobbins who right now is a free agent, but it looks like he may come back. You know, obviously he had his serious injury in week one last year. That might fit him. It might suit him to go in there and be part of a, a team there that one would stand there for me. But certainly knows, right? He's certainly not the player which you saw three or four years ago. You know, you look at fancy drafts three or four years ago, he was the, the number one selection in, in draft boards and, you know, he was arguably the number one uh, running back if he was to hit the open market. But I'd throw him and Austin Eckler into the same mix. Like Austin Eckler's declined significantly over the course of the last two years for me in terms of what we saw from previously with the charge. So it doesn't come as a surprise that he hasn't been picked up yet compared to the nature of what we spoke about earlier with all the running backs going off the board today. Let's look at the defensive side of the ball for, for a moment, Colin, again, because, you know, I, I see Owen in the comments there saying hopefully Daniil Hunter line, lands with the with the 49ers. But one player who won't be with the Niners next season is Eric Armstead. they fairly, uh, as uh, the phrase goes, aggressive negotiations there. 49ers asked him to take a pay cut. He refused out the door. Yeah, an, in an interesting one. You, you would imagine that... Um... The, he must have got a sense that the market is going to be pretty strong for him, um, given that, you know, um, I, I mean, look, was it was it a pay cut? Was it a restructure? Because I think th those are a couple of things to, to really look at. Uh, you know, sometimes it's talked about players are helping a team out, but it's a restructure, which ultimately means um, that the money is just coming in a different way, but the money isn't changing. Uh, at other times, it is uh, an actual pay cut. Say Von Miller agreed to that to remain with the Bills, because ultimately I don't think Von would have uh, been staying there. For Armstead, it's, you know, I mean, one would expect when you look at the landscape of the NFC that the 49ers should be there or thereabouts next year. So he has to feel um, that the, the money must be out there. Um, and yet, um, you know, he, he's may, maybe it's because it happened late. Um, but you would have thought that, you know, he was such a big name. It does mean for the 49ers, they'll surely have to designate him as a post June uh, one cut because the, the numbers are pretty eye watering if they don't. Um, but they, they will, you imagine, uh, look to, to do that. But he is a guy who has shown up on the kind of biggest stage. So I would have thought it, you, you could, you'd probably looking at another contender should be kind of the looking to take somebody like him because he appears to enjoy uh playoff football he appears to enjoy what it matters most and uh he is obviously a very talented player but you know the, re the reality for everybody is the cap means you cannot keep everyone you want to brian judging by the furrowed brow there over in the corner i observe on the screen there's obviously some breaking news yeah it's probably it probably makes sense, but it's probably a slight, a slight surprise for me. Marcus Davenport has agreed to a one-year deal with the Lions. Um, he obviously has a relationship with the defensive coordinator from previous times there. So I'd imagine from, from previous uh, times, I think with the Saints. So I'd imagine maybe it's one of those they think they can bring him in and he fit the system and, and work there. And, you talk, and we alluded to it earlier on, but we didn't really get into it. Malcolm Floyd, obviously, raised with the Bills signed for the 49ers. So that's a, kind of a, another player in which the 49ers will probably expect to bring into the mix defensively and I suppose puts the defense back on the same path as which you saw last year, despite the, the news today that potentially one of their arguably one of their biggest defensive uh, line guys may be moving on. But the the the, the Lions are doing some nice little things, and that that to me kind of it bodes well in terms of you know let's just keep tweaking what we have. We've had a really strong season. We have made the championship game. Can we just readjust things slightly and come back again stronger next year? No, Patrick Queen at the Ravens, uh, an interesting one for me. You know, formed a really productive tandem with. Um, Roquan Smith last year, you know, up there with probably Fred Warner and, and Dre Greenlaw is one of the best linebacker pairings in the NFL. But linebacker isn't a premium position in the in the modern NFL. Looks like the, the Texans touted as the most likely destination. But uh, Pro Bowl linebacker, it still looks like he's going to be heading out the door in, in, in Baltimore there. And no, no uh, they're, they're not looking like they're going to resign. Yeah, it's, it's not a premium position, as you say, unless it's the Bears last season. And then it's a very <laughs> premium position. But yeah, look. Obviously, 
he brought in Roquan Smith to play with him there. That that Ravens defense looked really, really good when, when those guys were together and it was really cooking. But again, sometimes decisions are made, players move on. And yeah, I think he's a player who will he will have a market. But as you say, because of the line the positional kind of would you say the what people think of certain positions, linebacker isn't really up there as someone that teams really, really want to pay. So it's be interesting to see you kind of wait to see what way that market plays out for them and, and how things kind of where teams are willing to go. But he is a player who will he will get a team and he will he'll do okay for himself, I think, in the end. Brian, a player who, who might well get a team. We talked a little bit of, earlier about David Bakhtiari and, and how go- good he is on his day, but how he's been uh, derailed by durability issues. Uh, Cowboys Tyron Smith is, is one who could be out the door. We talked about the, the, the Cowboys standing pat, but it, he's going to test free agency. There's probably a market for him. Again, player who's had his injury issues, but on his day, as good a pass protector as you could possibly have for your quarterback. I would have thought the commanders would have been on, on, on him already, but judging by the nature of what he's done today, taking two Cowboys players in, Dan Quinn having the relationship with their, he, for me, he'd be a good fit with a number of teams. I, I was surprised last week that they were so, I suppose, so open about the fact that they weren't going to bring him back and allow him to move on because on his day, he, he can step into it and he's durable and can do a good job for you. But the Cowboys seem to have transitioned away from this offensive line, that, which was arguably one of the best in the league over the course of the last four or five years. To, Clearly, seen a different size of it in terms of how they want to move on, but I'd be surprised. He, for me, strikes me as that second tier. We're going to see an abundance of signings over the course of today in the, in the next two, two to three days, 48 hours. And then come the weekend, we'll gradually see kind of the second round, the wave, second wave of players signing. I see him fitting into that. I think some team will pick him up. But yeah. Colm, I know you, you you joined us late, so you missed um, some of the conversation earlier. But you know, just interested before we wrap in in your take on this free agency. It's been a been a busy window so far. You know, again, kind of like last year. Funnily enough, teams are only allowed to talk to players and and, and tamper on March 11th, and yet they're able to do deals in about five minutes. It's amazing these meetings of minds the teams have on on the first day of free agency. But it has been an active window. Yeah, look, I think a couple of things um, probably jump out. I think the the fact that um, the, the jump in what guards are getting paid is probably really um, the, one of the kind of things that, that really struck me. Um, you saw the Jags give a big deal to Ezra Cleveland and people were kind of wondering about that. And then you saw some of the, the numbers from some of the, the deals today. Um, but the, the that's where it's going. It's good news uh, for the uh, in interior guys uh, that they are um, are going to to be you know almost on a par with with tackles you would have to say at, at this point in time and I suppose some of the money maybe that you're you know because that's going to come from somewhere and, and and it seems that some of that is coming from the safety position which appears to have been devalued by by the league um and, and then from the the running back position as well where the money hasn't gone up in the way that it has for say quarterbacks tight ends um wide receivers um you know you are seeing running backs getting the kind of notionally and and i'm sure you discussed this like this is headline news right today um the devil is in the detail we're going to find out about all these deals and, and what it really means but while you are saying that you know it it is amazing um that they're able to get the do- deals done so quickly um AI and and like what we're seeing and Kensington Palace and all that sort of stuff, I managed to get a glimpse into the future. And it, it's Brian O'Leary um, watching the Giants versus the Eagles uh, next season. And uh, there you have Brian uh, <laughs> watching uh, Saquon Barkley uh, run in a touchdown for the Eagles uh, in uh, MetLife. <laughs> Thankfully, that's not how our trip to, to Vegas ended because that was a pretty gruesome end for, for El Joe Pesci in, in, in Casino. <laughs> no, the other thing that, to your point is, you know, what, what free agency tells us, and it, it helps to tip the hands of the front offices, it tells you what they're thinking about what's available in the draft. And you see that both in the moves they make and in the moves that they don't make. And it seems to me there's a pretty obvious sense that you can pick up good value in terms of offensive line can pick up good value in terms of secondary in the draft. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the, the draft and free agency do go hand in hand, and it, it does tip the hand then to to maybe where certain teams are going to go. 
I mean, look, we know now Atlanta aren't going to try and move up for a quarterback. There we go. That's kind of sorted, you know. Maybe maybe the Giants will, for example, at six, you know, depending on unless they grab somebody else now, which I, I can't see happening. So, yeah, no, it, it's just that indicator, really, of where you think things are going to go. Teams are trying to maybe fill the odd hole in free agency Hopefully, with, with an eye to someone in the draft, or maybe they'll they'll get someone in free agency, which will then change maybe slightly what they were going to do in the draft. But again, it's it's all fascinating, and it's it's great that it all kind of links in. And for us, you know, the the fun of kind of watching what they do and and trying to kind of guess from there that do we know what they're going to do? Are we is he doing this or they doing that? Is it's just why it's 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 great days like this just to sit here and kind of go through the deals and and watch what's happening. And finally, Brian, again, if we're talking about things that, that didn't happen, one thing that was slightly surprising to me is, you know, when you look around some of the teams that we we haven't really heard a peep from yet, um, the Saints are, are one of them, you know, given their reliance on financial engineering for their roster, you'd think they'd have had to make a couple of moves, but they're uh, not doing anything quite yet. Yeah, hold my beer, as I say, because, you know, we're only we're only a couple of hours away from the Saints striking goal and coming up some magical free agency acquisition and people will tomorrow or the next day will be trying to get clarity around how they can do this from year after year they're completely um in over the cap the most fascinating thing for me over the course of week was jeff duncan uh, a saints beat writer who we've had on the show time and time again he he did a live show with us in london at the saints game a couple years ago against the vikings always really generous for his time coming on obviously he got into a bit of a spat with michael thomas who he suggested was going to be released and that for me has been the, the leading talking Talk of the town for the Saints over the course of last week because you're right. You mentioned the cards as well. Another team who've done very little and, and very little activity and very little world coming out of the camps. If some teams are maybe as as known as alluded to are, are more conscious around what they're going to do in the draft as opposed to free agency. If they pick up a player here and there, that will only kind of benefit what they want to do come draft night on the 25th of April. Ultimately, other teams see it very differently. You know the teams today that are going hell for leather. Free agency is priority. Draft complements. Other teams have a different strategic planner and how they're going to do it well when they do make those moves we'll be here uh, with you to analyze them uh, it's great to be back live with you on the irish nfl show plenty more to come uh, before we even wrap the the free agency window never mind with everything else we got coming down the tracks including of course that live show on buskers or at buskers on the ball 28th of march with uh, peter Quain, peter king as we were saying earlier all tickets sold out and thanks to everybody who bought one really looking forward to seeing you there and we're looking forward to being back with you discussing more free agent moves before that <laughs>